I've had the pleasure of actually working with a group of intermediary city organizations and others to help convene the cities and COP26. I serve as the executive director of the SFU Morris J. Wask Center for Dialogue, and I want to welcome all of you. I want to welcome our panelists here. It's wonderful to have you. And I want to begin by just recognizing some of our partners. You'll see them on the posters, but a big thanks to the Trottier Foundation, Federation of Canadian Municipalities, Canadian Urban Institute, ICLE, the Canadian Urban Sustainability Practitioners Network, CUSP, C40, and the Tamarack Institute. Um, I'm joined today, very happily joined today by David Miller, the Director of International Diplomacy for C40 and our former mayor of Toronto. David is also, and this is, I'm very excited about this because he brought one along for me, his new book called Solved, How the World's Great Cities Are Fixing the Climate Crisis. I can't wait to read this. And I think everybody should go out and get it because it's obviously about cities and fixing climate. I'm also thrilled, and I just have to say a thank you to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities staff who moved mountains to get you from a plane that you just landed on, Carol, to that seat right now. So a big welcome. Carol Saab, an incredible leader um, in Canada with the Fe Federation of Canadian Municipalities, the CEO, an award-winning lobbyist. I'm not sure there's an award you haven't won yet, Carol, and is certainly a great advocate for cities. And then I'm from British Columbia. So for me, it's a great pleasure to introduce our Minister of Environment and Climate Change, or is it Climate Solutions? Climate change strategy. So the fact that we have a minister for climate change strategy says something about our government. So Minister George Heyman, Minister Heyman has a very long tradition. Before he was elected in 2013, he was also working as the executive director before that with the Sierra Club of Canada. And he also is come out of the labor movement, having worked with the BC um, Employment Employee, so BCGEU, Government Employee Services Union. So Minister Heyman, it's great to have you here. I wanna give you a sense of the overview of how this is gonna go. It's gonna be a little bit different than just a panel discussion. It's four rounds. The first round, I'm gonna ask a few questions. Oh, there's Elizabeth May, wonderful to see you, Elizabeth. Um, so I'm gonna ask a few questions. That's round one. Round two, our panelists will ask each other questions. Round three is some rapid fire questions I'm gonna ask each of them. And round four is a chance for you in the audience to ask questions as well. So think of the questions, I'll be back to you and we're gonna come back and, and that'll be round four. We're gonna get you out of here on time. That's our promise to you. So if I cut you off, I'm gonna ask in advance for your permission. I know you are all have so much information to give, but I wanna make sure that there's a little bit of rhythm to this. Got, we're good with that? What if we say no? Uh, well, then I'm, you, you don't know me very well, David. Somebody said you facilitate like it's a German train station master. So you, you, know, you may have met your match. Okay, so let us begin. And so it is November 4th, 2021. And I'm gonna ask each of you to name this moment. What is significant about this time in relationships to cities or in relationship to climate change? Okay, so we're gonna start with you, David. And this is where I get to test if, if you're gonna make me work hard. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Shauna, for convening this and for your leadership in facilitating this really important dialogue about what cities individually and collectively through their organizations and in partnership with, with uh, other non-state actors like provincial governments are doing to address climate change. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Um, and I, I think for me, what's significant about November 4th and what's significant about this COP, um, and it's in a context, it's in the context that the council leader of Glasgow, so essentially the mayor, they have a parliamentary system, has said, while nations pledge, cities deliver. That's her theme throughout this COP. And in this context, for the very first time at a COP, cities 
were on the stage with the world leaders. And we were there because in a partnership between C40 and ICLE and with the support of, in Canada, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and GCOM and others, we managed to get over a thousand cities to pledge to do their part to keep the world on a path to 1.5 degrees, including their share of having emissions by 2030 and including outlining the actions they're gonna take over the next nine years to do it. This has never happened. And I, from my perspective, it's incredibly important because I think the national governments have been disappointing. They haven't sensed the urgency as a collective, but the city sector has. And to me, that's what this day, November 4th, is about at this moment in this COP. Wow, that is naming the moment. Thank you so much. Over to you, Carol. Thank you very much, Sean. And I also will echo a thank you to you for your leadership around COP, but also more broadly in this space of cities and climate. It's uh, certainly an important conversation. You've been leading an incredible dialogue, so thank you. Um, I'm going to build off what David said and, and then maybe put it in the Canadian context for us at FCM. And first, I'll say um, what is different about the moment it, and what I think we're starting to see is the necessity for multi-level alignment between orders of government and in a very fundamental way. And you've just heard from, from David. David about um, the sort of progress that cities have made onto the stage here and into the conversation at COP. Um, but it's critical. It's absolutely critical um, to do, to have and to do this. And in the Canadian context, I think we've got an incredible opportunity right now, if we can get aligned between orders of government, municipal, provincial, federal, uh, to drive and really implement uh, local pathways to net zero. And I, I'm focusing on the implementation here because there are some ready-made opportunities for us to seize on in the Canadian context. The the federal government has already made some substantive commitments. You know, we see um, that around the electrification of, uh, of transit, you know, a, a $2.7 billion commitment, that's 5,000 buses. Uh, we see it around a permanent transit fund, which has really, you know, a revolutionary opportunity for us as a country to affect mo modal shift. Um, and now we have a housing accelerator fund, another $4 billion commitment where uh, we really need to be driving that towards um, incentivizing density, transit-oriented development, and really, I think, imply a really strong climate lens onto that work. And, and we've got some incredible models, um, again, through uh, the federal government, the GMF, our Green Municipal Fund is already doing work in the affordable housing space on efficiency. Um, so we've got some good models to scale. Um, and then we know where we need to go further, right, around deep retrofits buildings, where we know that municipal fleets beyond transit are responsible for about 13% of our emissions. Yeah, you're going to come back? Okay, okay. It's always interesting to be asked to name the moment because everybody names it differently. But from my perspective, uh, this is a combination COP last year and this year. As a result of the pandemic, we, uh, we had a gap year. Uh, and it, uh, because of that, I think, uh, and because of events related to climate uh, around, the, around the world, but I'll speak uh, certainly in British Columbia and in uh, uh, the Vancouver area where I'm from, uh, uh, really cataclysmic for people. I mean, the prime minister said it, but we had a, a town burned to the ground in a couple of hours. So we have this moment with great expectations of people. Uh, while we're still in a pandemic where we've seen the world come together in an unprecedented way to fight the pandemic. I'm not necessarily saying totally successfully yet, but we've seen national and international efforts. And yesterday we had uh, Mark Carney on behalf of uh, global financiers say, okay, it's time to decarbonize. There's $130 trillion ready to go. What are you gonna do about it? Are you going to continue to tinker around the edges or are you going to create a decarbonized economy globally because the finance sector is ready for it. So that's the moment. Okay, so really important. And thank you, Minister Heyman, for reminding folks just how bad it got. In Vancouver, yesterday reported 595 deaths through the heat dome uh, in the summer. Insane. Um, reality that so many are facing. So I want to go and I want to ask you, Carol, what is different 
in this situation from other times with Canadian cities and climate? What's changed? And then if you want to, I mean, you've started to outline some of the big changes, but, but what's your asks at this point? Thanks very much, Shauna. It's, it's a great question because I do think we're at a particular nexus of circumstances and, and commitments that lead to a real significant opportunity, um, albeit a narrow window for us to, to capitalize and, and move on this. And, um, you know, in my, in my previous remarks, I highlighted some of the ready-made commitments that we've got to, to really seize on and mobilize from a climate perspective. Um, but I would say we have, you know, a, a local government or, uh, that is order, that is ready to move, that are leading some ambitious uh, ideas and and they're ready to scale. And we have a federal government that has made very big commitments in this space um, that has a positive relationship with municipalities and looking for an implementation partner. And if we can collectively work as well with our provincial partners to, to come around a table with our respective levers, with our respective tools and say, all right, let's move past some tradi uh, traditional jurisdictional barriers. This emergency isn't gonna wait for what is, in my opinion, a very outdated debate on many issues, let alone climate around jurisdiction. Uh, we need to act. And from our perspective, we, there are several areas that are high impact that we think we really need to move on. Um, one is around uh, buildings and deep retrofits, uh, building codes uh, as part of that. Uh, the other, I started to say, is around the electrification of, of transportation beyond transit as well, municipal fleets, you know, um, sort of garbage trucks, those large scale trucks um, and those for, for um, transport are responsible for 13%, over 13% of our emissions in Canada. Um, Similarly, waste and, and water, particularly landfill and methane is another opportunity for us in Canada. Again, that's over 3%. And just those two previous ones alone, you're looking at one fifth of our emissions that we, we know how to do, like resolve right now if we're able to coordinate action around. Um, and then of course, natural climate solutions, active transportation. I mean, we really need to bring these pieces together comprehensively. Um, and I think what's different now is that we, we cities and communities uh, are in the conversation in a different way and it's gonna require sort of further bold thinking in that direction. Minister Heyman, I want to ask you a bit of a difficult question here because one of the one of the challenges that cities have is that provinces and particularly some provinces will say we don't want to see a federal government have a direct relationship with cities because cities are a creation of the province. Yet cities don't have what they need and nor can the province give them what they need to address these very critical issues. I wonder if you can talk to where cities fit into your climate policy, but also what your government's doing to actually address those jurisdictional issues, because it is a problem across this country. Thank you. Well, first of all, we have a, we have a number of things we're doing with uh, local governments to support them. And I think, uh, the three things that a provincial level government needs to do uh, to support local level governments is to one, provide a strong foundation for climate action, uh, things like a carbon tax, uh, uh, things like um, a natural gas utilities cap that we just uh, introduced as part of our uh, Clean BC, our climate plan update. Second thing is to support municipalities with uh, things like transit, with uh, building codes. We have a Clean BC Communities Fund that supports infrastructure and uh, energy projects at a local level. And, and the other thing, and I want to talk about this a bit more later with, uh, with Carol, is uh, I think um, we have an organization in BC called Help Cities Lead. It's a political organization of mayors and councillors dedicated to finding ways for, um, for cities to blaze trails. And uh, I think one of the things the province needs to do is in fact to help cities lead, but uh, there's some tricky questions around that. So in terms of the federal government, obviously we welcome federal government support and, uh, and funding and transit infrastructure and a number of other ways to help both cities and provincial government policies. I guess my, my one request of the federal government, well, my one request at this moment of the federal government is to um, uh, talk to the province about how their ideas or their ideas to respond uh, to an initiative of cities fits into the plans that the province itself has for priorities on climate action or, or transit funding or, um, or various forms of regional transportation planning and infrastructure. Uh, because simply bypassing the province just uh, creates uh, a necessary potential conflict and also delay. 
Okay, David, you have been the mayor of Toronto and you're at C40. Um, my sense is you found ways to work with some of those kind of jurisdictional issues. So I'm really interested to know how you did that and how you would recommend doing it. But I also would like to hear from you, where's the innovation happening? What are you seeing? And if you can tell us a little bit about the compelling innovations you're seeing right now from cities. It's too bad Ottawa's not here to respond to this or to Minister Heyman. C'est dommage uh, Ottawa n'est pas ici. Um, because I, I'd like to hear Ottawa's response. I think when I was in office, what we did really successfully was build a coalition of mayors in and around Toronto, in and around Ontario, and across Canada in partnership with the big city mayors and FCM. Um, and focused our asks of Ottawa to be really clear and simple. And we, we, it was how we achieved the sharing of the gas tax that Carol referred to that's been used as the mechanism to create part of the new funding that's so critical for cities. And it was that collaboration, starting with the mayors of the biggest cities, frankly, but doing it in a way that ensured that everybody was engaged around one ask. And we got billions. And I, to me, um, that worked because it spoke directly to Ottawa. It benefited the provinces. We didn't have to worry about the jurisdictions because it was about one thing. That's part of the answer to your question. You sort of asked two. It's about, I in, I, I snuck in there. about innovation. And I, I think part of what I'm seeing, and it, it relates to the question you asked, Carol, what's different? What's different in this moment is climate isn't being led just by the, the C40 type cities. It's not being led just by Montreal and Vancouver, although Mayor Plante has done an amazing job in Montreal. She's incredible on environmental issues and deserves amazing uh, credit. Uh, bonjour, Valérie, <laughs> si vous êtes là. Um, the, the, now we're seeing climate as an issue that's driven across Canada by numerous cities and towns. You know, Bridgewater, Nova Scotia was the thousandth city to sign up for the city's race to zero. For the very first time in its history, it has transit because of Mayor David Mitchell. The very first time. And it has an award-winning program to do energy retrofits on buildings so that lower income people don't have to spend a disproportionate amount of their income to heat and cool their buildings. Uh, Brampton signed up to the city's race to zero. You know, and the mayor is the former leader of the Conservative Party of Ontario. Um, uh, Ajax signed up the city's race to zero. These are suburbs in and around Toronto. It was thought that the 905 was not an, a place where people were conscious about environmentalism. That's where the change is happening. And in a way, that's where a lot of the innovation is happening, yeah. like in Bridgewater. And, and I think th those mayors and those councils and those cities deserve a lot of credit as well. Thank you. Okay, so now this is round two. This is where you get to ask the questions. So we are going to begin with Minister Heyman. You get to ask the first question. Over to you. Thank you. Well, <laughs> no, I'm actually uh, going to add, ask it of, the, uh, of Carol, um, and I'm asking for some help in your ideas. Uh, in British Columbia, we've had for a number of years a program called the, uh, its acronym is CARIP, I think it's Climate Action uh, Rebate Incentive Program for Local Governments, where governments pay the carbon tax. We've had one in British Columbia since 2008, and then they get it back. Uh, and uh, Vancouver, uh, as an example, used it to for substantial funding, not the only funding, the city put in funding as well to establish a climate action team at the city uh, that's brought forward a huge number of very positive initiatives as part of their Greenest City Action Plan. I've also heard from lots of small municipalities, uh, this is just in response to David's comment, from around British Columbia who uh, on the scale they're capable of have shown tremendous leadership and ta taken very interesting uh, and innovative approaches to action. Um, they obviously get a smaller amount of money. Uh, the, the program was canceled last year and we're, or it's, it's ending this year and we're designing a new one to replace it. It will have a bit more money in it, uh, but I'm trying, to, I'm trying to find the balance uh, between uh, putting in place funding that respects uh, 
both size and regional differences to, to do a bit more for smaller communities and also uh, trying to think of what is the reasonable kind of direct climate uh, accountability to attach to uh, to receiving the funding. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Minister, for your question. I'm actually quite encouraged by your question, um, to be honest with you, because I think you raise a very important point, which I was hoping to find an avenue to come back to as well, hearing, um, hearing David's comments, which is around the necessity of capacity building. And I think th that your question really um, underscores, especially as you point to the success of the, the previous program, what's possible when we uh, think broadly about how to build the capacity and move communities of various sizes across the spectrum um, of climate action and build their maturity in terms of climate action and, and how they manage their assets and so forth. And I, I really think that um, our ability to, to make tangible progress to, to seed the kind of innovation that you're seeing in the Bridgewater and other examples in, um, in BC that I'm sure you could cite uh, at the ready um, is contingent on ensuring that while, while we continue to fund and ensure that the cities have the capacity to do what they need to do at scale, um, that we're making sure that we're sharing best practices, that we're convening communities um, of best practices Practice and that we're building the capacity of smaller communities. You know, we at the FCM run a number of um, capacity building programs uh, offline. Be happy to sort of share our, our experiences with those um, in turn because they are uh, attached to very clear, uh, tangible climate markers going forward for funding. Um, but we are seeing incredible outcomes as a result of that. And we're seeing uh, the ability then for uh, regions to then mobilize that into more of a comprehensive strategy at a regional level. And so um, I I, I'm very encouraged by your question. I think uh, it underscores the necessity of, of um, also building capacity, which isn't, you know, isn't the sexiest thing when you're talking about mitigation and climate funding, but is, is absolutely necessary if we're actually going to tangibly shift markers for the long term. Okay, my question, uh, Sean, I'll confess you asked the question of the minister that I was going to ask earlier <laughs> around, um, around intergovernmental coordination. And so maybe I'll pose it a, a version of that question to you, David. Um, in the, you've been the mayor of Toronto and you now have a bird's eye view of, of cities. Um, are there opportunities in the Canadian context from what you're seeing abroad uh, that are particularly ripe for governments, to, uh, pr provincial governments, municipalities, and the federal government to work together on to advance? I would wager you're because we've had a, a version of this conversation offline as well. You might talk about building codes. I'm kind of hoping you will, but you're allowed to say obviously whatever you like. <laughs> Thanks, Carol. I, I do think there, there's a really significant opportunity. And by the way, I, I think part of the answer to the previous issue, the gas tax and associated funding, it wasn't the only thing that was negotiated. The federal government sort of created two programs, one for smaller municipalities and one for the bigger cities. And the funding formulas were different because they had di a, a smaller place can't build a water plant on its own, for example, it's impossible. And I think that that way of thinking was smart. Um, I, I think there's a few areas, you know, first of all, Vancouver has, thanks to the province and congratulations, uh, George, for this, but Vancouver's got the world leading building code. We should be proud of this as, as Canadians. It is the best in the world. And it's based in part on carbon. Ottawa has a building code that is voluntary, but is incredibly influential, particularly in smaller towns across Canada. They've spent the last six years consulting about it. You know, how about we just take the Vancouver building code, the stepwise code, and say to Ottawa, why don't you adopt this as the national building code? I think for substantive perspective, there needs to be a really big fund to assist energy retrofits, particularly in um, apartment buildings along the lines of the tower renewal project in Toronto. And the great thing about it is in the end, it doesn't cost the federal government a penny because it's paid back over time. It just takes longer than uh, commercial investors want because they want their money back in a year or two. And it takes seven to 10. I think that would be transformative. And I, I think the seeds have been laid in the funding announcements, but the details of how it is implemented really matter. And that fund can be used as well to ensure that affordable housing transforms and becomes highly energy efficient. And the money can be used at the same time to make the housing better for people. So it's a win, 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 win. Um, but it needs to be directly accessible by the municipalities very easily in large amounts of money. 
And I think those details, if Ottawa can work those out in partnership with FCM and the Big City Mayor's Caucus, could be transformative. Your turn. I have a question for Minister Hamans. And it comes about uh, because BC has another area where they're a real leader, which is inequity. And we chatted about this a bit at the beginning. For those who don't know, the province of British Columbia signed a community benefits agreement with the trades. And it provides that on government procurements that flow through the CBA, there are, are extra opportunities for women, for indigenous people, and for other communities that have traditionally not had the opportunity to get those good union jobs. And in its first few projects, it's doubled the employment of indigenous people and women on these kinds of jobs. And it's come in much more efficiently uh, from a cost perspective than, than originally projected. So it works. How do we take that? And the, the other backdrop is today, Sharon Burrow, the, the head of the International Trade Unions Conference here at this conference, spoke passionately about the need for a just transition from climate. So Minister, I wonder if you have any thoughts about how others might use that community benefits model and how BC might to also apply to climate related projects and try to bring the benefits of the investments that have to come to dramatically recarbonize and ensure that marginalized groups get a real chance to have the good high quality employment that will ensue. I was mentally uh, going through several answers and uh, trying to presuppose what your final question would be. And I'm going to answer both, try to answer both your question and the two I thought you were going to ask. Uh, first of all, <laughs> first of all, I think it's, uh, you've, you've outlined some important um, features of the community benefits agreement, equity, uh, fair wages, um, benefits for local communities. Uh, and another part is apprenticeships and training. Uh, that's very much part of it. And, and obviously uh, for groups that have been marginalized, women, uh, indigenous people and others. I think the next step is to bring other socially desirable factors like climate into a, an overall framework of, uh, of government assessment. So one of the questions I thought you were gonna ask is what is uh, the BC government doing to, uh, to provide a climate screen on our capital investment? And the answer is we've, uh, we have for the last couple of years, and one of my roles is uh, deputy chair of treasury board, uh, put in place uh, an assessment requirement of the capital ministries proposing vertical infrastructure to um, look at a range of energy efficiency models. And we have a, we have a scale to, uh, to assess them in terms of what is their return on investment over, uh, over the life of the building. And uh, we are now approving projects, uh, some of which are, um, are close to or at, uh, at uh, net zero and others are as efficient as they can be. It's a little more difficult in a hospital setting because there's certain energy requirements. We'll get there, but not yet. So that that's one part of it. And uh, I think uh, you mentioned uh, the Vancouver Building Code. Part of um, our Clean BC update announced uh, a week and a half ago is building code updates that will require uh, all new buildings to be um, essentially uh, zero carbon by 2030. And uh, I actually asked Carol uh, a question was not the one I initially intended to ask. So maybe I'll get a, a second chance. Uh, I also think that, uh, and I, I think what you were referring to in terms of the Ontario uh, programs, I'm not entirely sure, but it sounded a bit like a variant on property assessed clean energy where, uh, and if it isn't, I'll, I'll just say that we are looking very much at bringing in, instead of rebates to uh, people like me who could afford to make the decision to retrofit my home anyway, and I have, um, to uh, put in place a loan program that isn't dependent on, uh, on rebates and the flavor of the month of incentives, but just provides funding for 
uh, energy efficiency uh, of, for buildings that's attached to the building. We'll have to find a way to incent landlords to take advantage of it, but uh, people don't have to worry about, will I get the benefit of this because I may sell the home? The loan stays with the home. In most cases, it can be repaid from energy savings. And we, of course, want to make that effective for commercial buildings as well as rental stock. And work is being done on that. We haven't, we haven't finalized the plan or announced it. But in my view, that is the greatest way to democratize and, uh, and be inclusive in uh, the sphere of energy efficiency. Yes, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Minister. I think the uh, the point I was making was ever so slightly different. It's about multi-residential buildings, so tenants, and it, and for various reasons, it's difficult to finance, even though the energy retrofits over time pay for themselves. And there's a huge place for Ottawa to step in. And I I think it's fair to say that Ottawa has said all the right things on climate. And it's also fair to say Ottawa has not done all the right things on climate. So this is a place where they could really put their money where their words are. I'm going to do a quick follow up to that because there is a program we've talked about. I mean, LC3, you were part of creating that LC3 local climate cities which is the first investment fund endowment that we've seen like the Toronto, based on the Toronto Atmospheric Fund model that's now in seven cities across the country. So it's a small amount of money though. It was just, you know, it's, I think it was 183 spread out across the country. What needs to happen on the investment side to de-risk some of the, the costs, to deal with some of the retrofits, to deal with it. I wonder, Carol, can you speak directly to the issue of the LC3s? Thanks, Shauna. I'll speak to the LC3s and I'll, I'll come back to PACE programs as well um, on this piece. Um, so where the federal government, and you're right that it's um, an initially across the seven cities, small small investment once you spread it out across the, across the seven, um, but they're doing amazing things and they're starting to pilot some amazing things. And in some cases, not pilot like an organization like the Toronto Atmospheric Fund has been doing excellent work for um, a very long time and is doing is sort of taking that work to the next level in the retrofit space because of the LC3 program um, that uh, we've been able to support them with with funding from the federal government, and so um, what needs to happen is now we need to scale that. Uh, it, it, we, you know, we know this is working. There are now, as I was saying earlier, being able to um, take action at a regional level on something like retrofits is a game changer. I mean, it really fundamentally is. And so we've got a model, we've got a mechanism that we know works. Time to scale it. And I would say the same thing, uh, similar to to your question, David. Around, um, I was nodding uh, effusively when you were talking about the necessity of, of sort of bigger, bolder investment in the retrofit space, multi-residential units, commercial buildings in, in cities. Um, this is work that we have started to invest in. Again, courtesy of the federal government, we've seeded a new program under the Green Municipal Fund that has started to do work in this space. It is now a ready-made tool to be scaled. Um, and similarly, um, through the recent investment, we've started to, um, it, we've implemented a program that is incentivizing municipalities across the country um, around around PACE programs, which you were speaking to, Minister, and, and we've gone from uh, about, you know, four generously five in the country to over 30 in one year, uh, courtesy of this program. And so another thing we should talk offline about is how to coordinate on that in BC. Um, but again, here's the here's the point. I mean, in so many of these cases, um, we know the what, and now we know the how, and we have excellent models of the how we need to scale. And, and that's where the issue of how we coordinate, how we bring the very levers which we have one of which at a city scale is not funding <laughs> in in the at the scale that's required to take action on this um, but the government has has done a lot of the right things and seeded this kind of investment we've built the machine so now we we really need to scale and work together and we need to figure out i agree wholeheartedly that we need to have these conversations with our provincial counterparts we need to coordinate on climate action plans um, so that we're we're moving things as comprehensively and more importantly as efficiently and and quickly uh, as we can given the given the scale and urgency of the crisis can I just add something on the LC3s? Do you mind? This one, and then we're going to round three. Then we're going to round three? Then we go to round three. But I'm allowed to finish round two? You can, round, you can finish round two. I, I'll be succinct. But the LC3, I mean, I'm very familiar, obviously, with the Toronto Atmospheric Fund. The LC3s are a great idea to spur innovation. But for me, that's about thinking about what are we going to be doing in 10 years? The question 
I think we need to answer as a country is what are we doing tomorrow? Well, today. I think we can start with today. It's in Glasgow. It's five o'clock. So it's one o'clock in Toronto. And it's much earlier in British Columbia. So we can start today. And what can we do today? Well, with the right rules in place, as Minister Heyman just acknowledged, we can have building codes that require net zero buildings by 2030. That can be established today. We could establish the federal government, for example. If you look at fleets, New York City has something like 17,000 green vehicles in its fleet. Why is our post office still buying gas and diesel vehicles? Why? Right? There's literally no reason. The, the vans they use are available in electric and the government could show leadership today. And on, on the, the LC3s are fantastic and they'll help generate new technologies. And there's some you can name like Shark, uh, uh, which uses waste heat that was developed in Vancouver and Carbon Cure, which is, is uh, injecting carbon into concrete, which is developed in Halifax, space for that. But if they put a billion dollars down today to do retrofits on large apartment buildings in uh, virtually every Canadian city, there would be a massive greenhouse gas reduction and a huge increase in employment. And if you use the BC model, that employment would be for women and, and indigenous people and marginalized people. There's incredible things that could be done today. And, and with the urgency, I hope what we see is more of today and a bit less of tomorrow. I'm trying to figure out when I can vote for you. I, this is, no, it's just, I miss that opportunity in Toronto. I want to ask each of you, that, that was a powerful set of what we need to do tomorrow. So I'm going to go to you each and I want you to adjective. We're going to start with COP. And Carol, this is a little bit unfair because you've just arrived. So, so you can come up with your adjective or your word, but these are rapid fire. So this is rapid fire. We're going to go fast through this. One adjective or phrase to describe your impressions of COP, this COP so far. David. Disappointing. Oh, you get a phrase with that, David. Well, I was trying to be economical with words. I know, but. Moments of inspiration, particularly by cities and non-state actors in the midst of not enough by nations. Uh, because I just arrived, though I've been following closely, why don't I say what I, what I hope this in one word this oh you are okay because uh, what i would say is is um ambitiously aligned that we're we're really going to talk about how we work together uh across levels uh to get to get action done today and tomorrow do i get two words i took two, I took two so. unresolved potential Okay, so when you think of the task before you in each of your contexts, so thinking about the task before you, um, lending, leading on climate change, who are you looking for inspiration from? And we're just going to go through this again, this order, because it's fast with the mic. David, over to you. I, I wish Minister Hamans was going first. He was so eloquent. Um, well, I, I mean, you know, in my role, I looked to inspiration from the mayors of the world's great cities, but my team works a lot with youth. Yeah. And I think the energy and passion of young people has ensured that people can't ignore the climate crisis. And I looked to inspiration from them. They're the leaders of today. They're not the leaders of tomorrow. And that's, you know, when I get up in the morning, that's where I get my inspiration. That's you over there, Anna. <laughs> Hey, uh, ooh, also in my role, I, I would say, uh, obviously, the mayors and the leading mayors on climate in the Canadian context, but why don't I give you a, a more interesting answer than that? <laughs> um, and I would say that uh, I really look to Indigenous leaders, uh, especially in the Canadian context, that we need to be able to have this conversation comprehensively with a reconciliation lens on it, and that we need to be um, listening both for inspiration, but also um, expertise and, and guidance from, from Indigenous leaders. Well, let me see. Young leaders have been covered. Indigenous leaders have been covered. So I think what's left is uh, people who listen to young leaders and Indigenous leaders. Nice. Oh. Very nice. You, you are so smooth, Minister. I'll just... 
nicely done. Okay, so now, now I want you to think of inspiration. What city stands out for you? And it can be in Canada, it can be in the world. What city stands out for you as a leader in addressing climate change? There you go. Bogota. And if you've seen the mayor of Bogota, she is a dynamo and they're doing active transportation. They're building their first subway system in its history. They're electrifying all their bus fleet and they're doing it all in a way that thinks first about the needs of the least well-off. And if you've ever been to Bogota, that's a massive, massive group of people that deserve the attention and support of their city government. She's fantastic. I, I have to say her picture leads my blog today in the Georgia Strait, Mayor Claudia Lopez. Okay, uh, I'm going to pick a Canadian city that was dangerous in my context to single out, <laughs> single out one. Um, I'll just, I'll, and I'll caveat by saying I could choose of many impressive Canadian cities, um, but I will, uh, I will uh, say Montreal. I, David has has call, called out Mayor Plant on this, um, but she really has been just boldly and very ambitiously driving a climate agenda that is fueled with an equity lens, uh, doing some very, you know, politically risky things. Uh, for her uh, and her and her party, um, but really leading the way on this file. And so I would I would highlight Montreal. It's, dan it's dangerous to name one, so I won't. I would say uh, any city that pushes the boundaries of uh, of what people think is uh, reasonable, but eventually come to accept as necessary and even better. Uh, so I think uh, what Mayor Plant is doing in Montreal is great. Vancouver, of course, both because it's in British Columbia. I know it best and I live there and has done uh, tremendous things over the last decade. Uh, Bogota, of course, particularly because, and I have been there, it is in the midst of a country uh, that is riddled with horrific violence uh, and paramilitary action. Bogota itself, when I was there, was a and, and may in many ways still be an exceedingly dangerous city. So to make those transformative changes, uh, not only changes the climate literally, but I think can also change the, uh, um, the safety and quality of life for, uh, for residents at every level. And uh, any, any city where uh, I'm more worried about a bicycle traffic jam than an automobile traffic jam. Nice. <laughs> Minister, you managed to cover all cities, plus name a few too, so well done. Um, okay, on a scale of one to 10, how hopeful are you that this COP will bring us closer to meeting our Paris Agreement goals of holding the temperature increase to only 1.5 degrees? So how hopeful? David? Well, I, as you could tell from my earlier answer, I've, I've lost confidence a little bit in the intergovernmental diplomatic negotiations to get us where we need to be quickly enough. But in a way, that's almost beside the point. Paris, although the target is two degrees, not 1.5, and 1.5 is scientifically necessary, in Paris, the nations agreed. So there is an agreement and a blueprint. And what makes me optimistic is not the diplomatic negotiations, but the COP itself is a signpost, the bringing together of civil society, you know, the bringing together of business. I mean, people can be justly critical of banks who are still financing the fossil fuel industry, but on the other hand, 17 trillion or whatever was announced is pretty significant. And so to me, what makes me excited and optimistic and hopeful and, you know, I wrote my book because I'm actually optimistic. I'm just not optimistic about national governments and their negotiations. I think we've all been given permission and instructions to act. And I see the, the city, cities, certain provinces and, and subnational governments and certain businesses as really driving change. And I think there's massive potential and I actually think it's really exciting. Well, if, if you ignore what's happening over there, where is over there, by the way? Is it that way or that way? Okay, if you ignore what's happening over there, I, I'm an eight. Woo. That's, that's nice. Okay. 
I'm glad you went back for a number. I'm trying to trying to calibrate over here. Um, I too, I too am optimistic, and I would agree less less so in the context um, of sort of the formal negotiations around COP and in terms of the urgency with which we need to move. Um, but certainly in the Canadian context, as where I think you know we we're able to move some markers uh, as a country through the kind of convening and and um, pressure that a COP enables us to leverage. I would say I'm more optimistic there, um, and I think that we've got. But, uh, you know, as I said this before, we've got uh, a willing federal government to start having this conversation in more direct ways with cities than we than we have before. That causes me great uh, optimism. Um, we have cities, uh, you know, I have a luxury of having a bird's eye view of this in my role that are more acting more ambitiously than they have before. And I think we have some provinces that are going to pave the way. And I think BC is a great example where they're going to be willing partners in, in addressing this as comprehensively and in a coordinated way, um, as coordinated way as we need to. And so maybe if, if I'll, I'll go, uh, I'll go seven on COP and eight for, for the Canadian context. <laughs> well, I'm going to say 10, but only because you asked a question with a very low bar. Are we going to move closer and one inch is closer? So, uh, but do I think it will uh, get us as far as we need to go? Uh, I wouldn't say that, uh, although I'm ever hopeful. Uh, but and it's $130 trillion, David, uh, 17 would be astounding 130 is uh, kind of beyond my comprehension, but I, I can comprehend it enough to know it is potentially a momentum builder that uh, that will be huge and and in itself could uh, drive government agreements. Uh, and I, I'm going to be optimistic because to be pessimistic is personally paralyzing and uninspiring for anyone I come into contact with. Okay. Last of the rapid, rapid fire questions, okay? November 12th, we're at the end of COP. What's the headline you want to read about Canada's role at COP? You can start with me. All right, I'll take it. Uh, one headline. Uh, Canada leverages cities and communities to its to a fuller potential. Canada commits to leapfrogging past incrementalism. I like that one. <laughs> 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 That's a headline in a broadsheet newspaper, not a tabloid. I, I something about Canada acts finally, or perhaps Canada announces entire post office fleet to be electrified. <laughs> Something really basic. That's great. Okay, I want to see if there are any questions in the audience. Does anyone have a question they'd like to ask? We've got a runner. Questions from the audience. Oh, there we go. Anna Gonzalez. Hey, Shana, I feel like you pointed. I can't because I'm going to hear myself or I can speak loudly. I'm not sure what's easier. I, I appreciate that some of the inspiration that you mentioned were young people and indigenous folks. Um, I'm looking for concrete examples, not platitudes of how are you all in your individual roles, but also organizations actually making room to be beyond inspired, but also meaningfully engaging with those constituencies and others that have been historically and systematically um, kept out of the city level action. So important question in terms of moving beyond platitudes. How are you actually doing this work? How are you? First of all, I do want to acknowledge we have the former deputy mayor of Athens and the current climate guru who has joined us to learn from Canadian municipalities what's happening in Canada. Um, so uh, C40 is taking this very seriously. And we, we are working in collaboration with Fridays for Future and other youth organizations um, to both have a, a youth Council's the wrong word, but our mayors meet regularly with youth and have crafted a joint agenda and actually issued a statement a couple of months ago uh, about what the world should be doing, which was 
from my perspective, extremely bold. And you've heard me today. I felt like, boy, this is so bold. I wonder if the mayors can do it. But they did. Uh, and it was driven by the young people, really. And it talked about fundamental transformations we need to make in the economic system to make change. And as part of that work, um, it's a goal to set up the same kind of liaison and conversation in the individual C40 cities. A couple have engaged youth in a formal way, but not all. So I, I think it's giving a direct voice uh, to speak truth to power to young people globally. And I, I think is is quite effective on on both sides. Hey, thanks, uh, thanks, Anna, for the question. And uh, I'm not surprised that's your question. It's a good one <laughs> coming from you. Um, we're doing a number of things, and, and this is something that FCM is taking quite seriously as well. And we're doing it from from different parts. And I'll say first, as an organization, um, we're really making some substantive changes uh, to uh, to our work as an employer to make sure that we're bringing in lived experience, uh, fun, like into the bones of the organization. Um, but beyond that, we're we're really wanting to be able to do that kind of capacity building work uh, with our members and for our members. And so we've uh, mobilized a task force around equity and reconciliation um, with cities from across the country. Um, and part of what that group is going to do is going to inform what are the highest impact areas for capacity building that we can do in this space to connect municipalities going forward. So one of the earliest things beyond training that we're doing um, is also building a community of best practice uh, with, and so connecting the various offices across the cities um, who are doing this work. We have people doing amazing things uh, in Indigenous offices around reconciliation on anti-racism offices across the country. Um, and they're, they've been working in a silo. And so we're bringing them together very tangibly with resourcing uh, to be able to mobilize that kind of best thinking uh, and work going forward. Uh, and we've made a commitment as an organization, which we're uh, admittedly playing catch up and are on the sort of front edge of this work um, to, to meaningfully apply an equity lens across our policy uh, going forward in the in the context of, of climate that obviously um, is going to be quite significant uh, a shift uh, going forward and so um, it involves bringing in the the right experience uh, fundamentally uh, resourcing that agenda very tangibly um, and and sort of investing in the capacity for that to happen locally at a, at a community level I couldn't quite hear the question because uh, my headset wasn't working, but I think I've got the drift. So um, I would say the first thing, um, I, I'm gonna speak from a provincial government perspective, and I, and I think we've tried to do these things, is um, <clears throat> set a clear target, uh, develop a plan to meet the target and have principles for that plan. And the principles that we have are um, inclusion, uh, equity, affordability, and reconciliation. Uh, as well as uh, ensuring that it contributes to uh, a sustainable and viable economy. Uh, consult on elements to put into the plan, uh, on, on producing the plan, have it verified independently, and then have an accountability mechanism to report on uh, how we're doing against what we said we would do. You may need to put on your... I'm going to just over to Elizabeth and we've got two others and I'm going to see after Elizabeth I'm going to ask we're just going to go to the questions themselves we'll get a couple more and then I'll ask you to respond to them so let's get the questions and then thank on. thank you, no, you just, just, just all right thank you Shauna uh, first of all I guess I'll, I'll just out myself for people in the room don't know that I'm a, I'm a federal member of parliament in Canada with the Green Party so I'm the only federal order of government person here uh, so I, I, I apologize I'm sure that you invited people from the federal level of order of government who should be here uh, and thank you Sean and thank you Ickley and thank you C40 and thank you for all the work that everyone's doing on on the most vibrant productive and impressive actual achievements within Canada on climate are in my view at the municipal and local order of government. I also wanna speak as an angry British Columbian because 595 people didn't need to die if we had acted like we understood what hotter weather means. 
my husband left me right after my operation because he said, it's going to be 47 degrees in Ashcroft. I have to get going now. I've got to make sure because the pumps have broken down. I don't know why our healthcare system and our government didn't act to protect those people. And in an equity lens, what I want to say too is that most of the people who died were seniors and were, and were poor. And one of the things that happened, which is, again, I'm going to shift now to be more positive. It's a nature-based solution that intersects with poverty and equity and justice is that in heat domes, we need more shade. We need more trees. And we can't tell the poor people they're not allowed in Strathcona Park because they might camp there when it's a matter of life and death that they get someplace shady and get to someplace safe. Uh, my husband's daughter, my stepdaughter nearly died in that heat dome. It went to 50 degrees Celsius where she was living in Ashcroft. And she's a young and healthy woman. So we underrate the threat of heat stress deaths. And it wasn't a whole summer in which they died. It was four days. And it wasn't hours in which Lytton burned down. The town of Lytton burned down before the fire truck could get out of the firehouse. So we should unpack all the lessons of this heat dome. My question is entirely different. We just had a cabinet shuffle. And I see some promise there for a way that Canadian federal government, which I, I stand with David Miller and saying disappointing, disappointing. But they just put Dominic LeBlanc in. He's still Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, so Fed Prov. He's also been handed infrastructure. So I'd love to have a sense from these three brilliant people whether you see that as a deliberate climate component to how we solve problems across jurisdictions? Is this an opening? Okay, so is Dominique LeBlanc an opening? Hang tight, I'm gonna get a couple more questions here. Well, thank, thank you, I'm Nick, Nicholas Swartz. I chair the Independent Forum of Commonwealth Organizations. Sorry, and I'm hearing my echo. <laughs> thank you, and I'm really interested in having had an inspirational session now, electrifying if you want the worst pun of the day probably but uh, I think I'm interested in the emergent concept of paradiplomacy or working cross-nationally at sub-national level and I wonder if there are ways that one couldn't enhance strengthen and formalize that so that there would be an international meeting of this scale but that was at the sort of middle level of government and I think in in commonwealth terms how can there be north, north and north, south policy transfer of the sort of achievements that you're outlining that some governments, even in rich countries, seem to find impossible to countenance. Um, and so it really is about strengthening and, 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 for example, also reaching out, for example, to the Caribbean, where a lot of Canadians used to go on holiday and whether you could have partnerships or twinning from Canadian to Caribbean cities. Okay, so we've got another, the sub-regional cross, that horizontal organizing. We're gonna get two more questions, Javeria. Okay, great questions. Um, uh, Javeria Veltkamp, I was formerly with City of Vancouver working on the Greener City Action Plan. Um, I was amazed to see the federal budget, I think last year, which felt like so much of that was being transposed to the federal level. So what a great way to scale things up. What I would like to hear about is there are all these sort of infrastructure projects, energy projects that we're talking about mapping over. What about the economic transformation? My role was green economy. And in, in Canada, we don't yet have that vision, that industrial strategy of how we're gonna transform the whole economy. Um, we have the net zero accountability, but then how does that actually land? So what, how, what are the multi, uh, level collaborative bodies or institutions that can connect cities, provinces, and the federal government around economic transformation. So a question on economic transformation. You've got three big questions. We've got two more, and then we're going to call it, okay? We have a question here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Proskovia Vikman from Uganda. I got interested uh, from the panelists when they were discussing about the cities. And then I realized that in Uganda, we have 
uh, Canadian support from, from government. But then currently we are having a government that is bent on getting the um, natural forests. We have Bugoma forests, I think you've heard about it. And they have given it to plantation farmers. And that is in the Albertan region. And that is in Uganda, if you know, the, the, um, the Western side where the, the oil, <laughs> also the oil uh, has been found. Oh, no cities, I'm, I'm coming to that because that particular region has Hoima city okay. as a city. But then the, when we talk of climate change, getting greener cities, helping the North and South, and yet we, we uh, as I come from a region, I would say that we are indigenous, we're almost extinct right now. How do we get the Commonwealth countries, because Uganda is part of the Commonwealth when you talk of the Commonwealth in, in, in the Commonwealth world. How do we get the Commonwealth voice and probably help the indigenous people in Uganda push it at a global level? Two. I'm going to just stop it there because we've got one more question to go. I'm sorry. sorry. It's just we're going to come. So an important question from Uganda in terms of sport. Uh, Ver Veronique Lamontagne from the city of Montreal. I just want to, act to thank you for the acknowledgement of the leadership of our mayor and our city. Uh, just one comment. Uh, I would really like to encourage stronger ties between Canadian cities so that we form a stronger voice uh, to advocate for change on climate change. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. So three conversations, three questions about collaboration across countries, regions. You've got, do we have an opening with the intergovernmental relations? And uh, we had the other on the economic strategy. Over to you, David. I, a lot of questions. I, I'll maybe just comment and try to pull together um, the thread about collaboration, in, including to support uh, Uganda and one brief comment about the economic transformation, if that's okay. Um, so, Veronique, merci beaucoup uh, pour uh, votre travail. C'est excellent. Um, I, I think the interesting thing for me about the diplomatic cooperation internationally between cities is that unlike the intergovernmental process at COP, which I think it's fair to say hasn't succeeded in the way that the original designers hoped, you know, we took 21 years to come to an agreement, and now we're probably going to take nine to do the next part of that agreement was supposed to take five because of the requirement of unanimity. So there's always a bad actor. Canada was the bad actor in Denmark. You know, uh, Prime Minister Harper got the fossil fuel of the day award, and I know because I accepted it on his behalf, and he didn't like my acceptance speech very much. Um, the, uh, I said I was embarrassed to be Canadian. I think unlike this system, which is sort of like justice. It's slow and grinds very fine. What's beautiful about the city's um, intergovernmental relationships is that they're nimble and they don't require unanimity. They just require a critical mass. And that includes on finance. You know, one way I'm, I'm not familiar with all the details of, of the situation in Uganda, but one way to address the issues is to ensure that proper finance goes to the cities in Africa so that they can actually build cities that accommodate economically the people who are coming to the informal settlements who are often the people leaving the rural areas. And perhaps that's possibly one uh, arrow in the quiver to address the fossil fuel related depletion of, of nature. And final point I wanna make on the economic transformation. I, I believe this is critical. And some mayors are way ahead of the common thinking of national governments. National governments are wedded to an idea that we have to have continued growth. This is impossible ecologically, we only have one planet. The emerging best economic thought in my view thinks about how we have shared prosperity rather than continued growth, which is what is destroying the planet. Very loosely, it's a change in economic thinking away from neoliberalism. And unfortunately, a lot of the things we do in Canada about climate, like the carbon, federal carbon tax, are done in kind of a thinking with the old school. How do we facilitate green growth? And I don't think that's the right question. It's how do we ensure a joint prosperity 
that respects our planetary boundaries. And there are some really good economists studying this, including one at the University of Victoria, who has done such complicated work, I couldn't begin to explain it. But his thesis includes the physics of planetary boundaries in an economic analysis of how we create a new economy. And we see bits of that beginning to start all over the place. In some cities like Oslo that has a carbon budget, in others that are thinking like Phoenix about waste systematically in a reuse kind of thing. And then in, in what young people are doing, I understand there are websites where you can sell half a bottle of shampoo. Or give it away. Or give it away. Buy nothing at least. Yes, brilliant. So the beginnings of that new economic system are starting beyond my current knowledge to say how it's going to finish, but that's starting. And I think what we need to do as governments is support that kind of movement uh, rather than this outdated concept of just measuring growth, because that's what got us into the problem in the first place. We each have about three minutes. So. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll, I'll too uh, try to pull some of these threads together, but I'm going to start, Elizabeth, on your question around cabinet because it's a good one. Um, I I do think actually that it it uh, it was intentional, and I do think it's an opening. I think it's an important um, crossover for the Minister of Intergovernmental Coordination, who is working both actively with the provinces, but also very directly with FCM and and cities uh, through us. Um, and so I think they are very intentionally thinking about how to take some next steps there. The other thing I wanted to point out about something that I find very encouraging around the, the cabinet um, that's been announced um, in a similar sort of vein to your question uh, is that they've also tied uh, the housing portfolio to infrastructure now. And that, and so Minister Hussein as the housing minister um, has, you know, we've been talking about the affordability crisis in the countries now, you know, got a massive mandate from the Canadian people to take some significant strides on that. And they're very deliberately intersecting it with in infrastructure investment. And I would argue um, we'll need to, and FCM will certainly be supportive of this, uh, comprehensively looking at it through um, climate. And it, it shouldn't be understated that he's also carrying um, the portfolio newly added to his portfolio of diversity and inclusion. Um, and so I, I think there is some, some really good uh, thinking happening uh, that's sort of enabling potential. Uh, we'll see if we can actually use that as the opening and, and lever that. Um, but I'm encouraged by 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 those by those signals and certainly um, cities and communities through FCM are going to be advocating for that kind of comprehensive and integrated approach to to uh, all federal programs going forward, uh, uh, particularly around a climate and equity lens. Um, I'm looking at the minister's cheat sheet here of listing the questions. Thank you, Minister. <laughs> he doesn't have his answer. It's just the question. Yes, in international relationships. Well, I, what I wanted to say about that is, is honestly, I, I can tell you in the big city context um, first, and then I'll talk about the broader broader sector. But in the big big city context, we are at an unprecedented moment of um, coordination and collaboration. The big city mayor's caucus is very united, even with recent elections. I think it is further enabling um, the the unity of that caucus um, going forward. And so we're we're actually, you know in terms of having the conversations and strategizing together as cities doing quite well through through FCM and, and forums, where we're lacking is, is twofold, and it's to the question that was asked. Um, one is, uh, I think there's a lot more we could be doing to be sharing best practices and, and really sort of sharing capacity across the country. Um, and that's certainly a direction that FCM is going to be trying to, to go down more and, and investing in that space um, so that we're, we're bridging the silos that in, in a lot of areas including climate. Um, and then the other is tied to the international sphere, where I think Canadian cities are really are leaders. Um, and I think we can take up some more leadership space in, in the international networks uh, and really hopefully uh, help accelerate some of that city leadership uh, going forward. And so that's another direction that we certainly will be pushing for um, going forward. And I'll maybe just answer one more thing on the um, e economic uh, angle there that was asked is, is um, certainly, and I'm glad for the question, because I think it, it really needs to be, especially 
especially in the context of climate, uh, or something that we really focus on in the Canadian context, we, we really have to help energy community, uh, energy producing communities transition um, successfully. Uh, that's going to require significant economic diversification. It's going to, and then beyond that context in the in the country, really being able to to tie our uh, regional develop uh, economic development approaches to some of our targets in the climate space, I think is just critical and, and foolish of us not to do that. So, so I'm encouraged. Thank you for the question and, and hope to see some progress in that field as well. Thank you. Well, I'll do my best to be quick and try to touch on all of the questions, perhaps. Uh, I think the, uh, the question about Dominic LeBlanc has uh, largely been answered, but I think the other significant cabinet change is uh, Jonathan Wilkinson in natural resources, having a, a former climate minister uh, move to natural resources to try to bring some coherence between the policies on climate and natural resource, as well as uh, infrastructure and working with cities. Uh, the comment about uh, a forum for subnationals uh, as part of COP, I, I think it exists. Every COP I've been to, I've benefited from and participated in uh, significant exchanges of views with uh, other state level governments as well as municipal governments. And uh, I mean, I, I don't get to sit in the national negotiations, so that, that's what I'm here for. Um, and that's what many others come here for as well. And I'll continue to have those, uh, those meetings today. On economic transformation, I think uh, I think the only thing I'd add is, you know, we need to look at um, at what exists in our economy today. Uh, uh, ask the question about uh, does that fit, and if so, in what form? In a zero carbon uh, economy of um, you know twenty or thirty years from now, and if not. Uh, what are we doing to uh, transition and transform that and provide for people who uh, work in those sectors today to continue to be productive and have value and feel fulfilled? Um, I think uh, globally, we all have a responsibility to, uh, um, to provide uh, the assistance that we know we should be providing to Indigenous people in the North, to Indigenous people globally, and uh, um, whether those mechanisms are at a national level or uh, if there are subnational opportunities for exchanges uh, is a complicated topic, but it's one uh, worth thinking about. And, uh, and finally, um, I think uh, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities in Canada I think ensures there's good coordination between cities. There are organizations to do that globally. Uh, from my perspective, it's critically important that uh, that provinces and states have uh, have ties between our local governments and ourselves that uh, that are aren't simply kind of vertical flowcharts, but are real partnerships and collaborative exercises. As the mic passes, can I just? give a shout out to Mayor Savage from Halifax. He's He's been a real leader in climate and I don't think gets enough uh, acknowledgement. We're thrilled that Mayor Savage, who is the head of the Big City Mayor's Caucus of the SCM is arriving. He'll be coming for four days and uh, we intend to work him hard in that period. So it's great. I just want to say a big thank you to you, to all of you who have joined us. Tonight, we do another daily briefing. Each night, we do a daily briefing on Canadians and cities. Tonight, we're going to have a technical briefing with a philanthropist, author, climate uh, thought leader, Bruce Laurie. We'll also be hearing from a leader within the Kenyan government. And... Uh, and we'll be continuing those all next week. So I want to, I maybe, I think each of you will be brought into that at some stage. So, so a warning. Big thank you to all of you, to all of our partners, um, to all of you who asked questions, and I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but a very big personal thanks to each of you. David Miller, Carol Saab, Minister J George Heyman, thank you so much. And let's have a round of applause for our moderator, incomparable Shauna Sylvester. Merci beaucoup.